started. Uh, thank you guys uh, for joining us on this beautiful afternoon. Uh, we're very glad that you're here for our first uh, virtual conversation of the year. My name is Claire Eagle and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Historic New Harmony. Um, Historic New Harmony is a unified program of the University of Southern Indiana and the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites. Uh, we work to share um, our history of utopia as well as um, work to ensure that we are a living laboratory for the university and their faculty staff as well as students. <clears throat> Following a successful year of uh, virtual conversations last year, uh, we're, we're glad to be starting a new series. Um, this year, though, focused on our celebration of the 250th anniversary of Robert Owen's birth. Uh, we're having uh, 250 days of activities and programs and events uh, and social media posts, all sorts of things to celebrate um, the 250th birthday of Robert Owen, who was the uh, founder of our second attempt at Utopia. A few housekeeping things. Please keep yourself muted uh, while uh, Dr. Elliott gives his presentation. Uh, if you have questions or comments as he presents, please share them in the chat. I'll keep an eye out and make sure that they get asked during our Q&A. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to our Historic New Harmony playlist on the USI YouTube page. Um, in the next few days or so. So if you have to leave early for any reason or are having uh, connection issues, you will be able to finish. Uh, it'll be posted probably within 48 hours. Uh, so Dr. Bill Elliott earned a BS uh, in geology from the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown and an MS and PhD in geology from, University, or from Indiana University, excuse me. He started his teaching career at Southern Oregon University in 2002 and joined the geology and physics department at the University of Southern Indiana in August 2009. Since 2009, he has developed a passion for the history and philosophy of geology, and in particular, the historical significance of New Harmony. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Bill Elliott. Thank you, Claire. I'm, I'm very honored to be part of the presentation today, uh, celebrating Robert Owen's 250th birthday. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, start my uh, slide presentation. And uh, as I was thinking about the topic that I wanted to pursue uh, for this particular presentation is I wanted to reflect a little bit on the, the communal society that Robert Owen uh, developed and implemented in New Harmony, Indiana. And although this community only lasted about two years, uh, it is really incredible the types of things that evolved and came out of this experiment. And so uh, that's where the title Fruits of Failure come from, comes from today is thinking about this lasting legacy of, of the people uh, that lived and worked in New Harmony following this communal experiment. Um, I, I also wanna say that I've been involved in numerous projects and have benefited from support from Indiana Humanities as well as uh, Historic uh, Southern Indiana and Historic New Harmony. And so uh, some of the work that I'll be presenting today has benefited from that support. So I, I pulled two quotes to kind of start things off today. Uh, and, and I think this, this first quote really uh, ties very well with one of the main philosophies that Robert Owen pursued. And that was the focus on education. Um, that this is a very important priority, uh, both for uh, children, but also for adults. And uh, this is one of the reasons that William McClure and Robert Owen had so much in common as they both were very much uh, dedicated to education. The, the lower one is kind of tied to, to the topic at hand. And, uh, you know, near the end of Robert Owen's life, he was asked, uh, you know, do you regret anything? And, and it's kind of funny because 
He said, I gave important truths to the world and it was only for want of understanding that they were disregarded. I have, I've been ahead of my time. So really, really uh, telling with respect to some of the progressive ideas that Robert Owen put forth. So a little bit about New Harmony. I know that we have a lot of people from a lot of different areas uh, on the uh, presentation today. And so uh, New Harmony is located in southwestern Indiana on the Wabash River. Uh, it's located in Posey County, Indiana. And, uh, and uh, this was a very remote location uh, early in the 19th century. And the town was settled by uh, a group of harmonists led by Father Rapp in 1814. And it was amazing what they accomplished in just 10 years. So in 10 years, they constructed over 180 buildings, dormitories, businesses, kilns for red, uh, red uh, wear and brick, uh, whiskey distillery, and, and a, a very large uh, church as well as a granary. Um, Rapp and the harmonists uh, looked to move back to Pennsylvania in about 1825. And so they put the whole town up for sale. And, and that's really where Robert Owen comes into to, uh, New Harmony and decides that this community, this built community would be perfect for his social experiment. And so in 1825, uh, Father Rapp and the Harmonists sold the whole community of New Harmony to Robert Owen. And Robert Owen partnered with William McClure and uh, William McClure's part of, of this uh, community was really focused on education and the natural sciences. And so William McClure recruited a lot of the natural scientists, educators, artists that, that made their way to New Harmony. And there's a voyage down the Ohio River uh, on, the, on the boat called Philanthropist, sometimes referred to as the boatload of knowledge. And they left in December of 1825 and made their way down the Ohio River to New Harmony. And this essentially was the first uh, significant incursion of, of scientists and educators into the community of New Harmony uh, for this social experiment that Robert Owen was conducting. So, you know, my talk, I'm gonna really kind of focus more on the scientific innovations and some of the educational and artistic innovations, but there's a lot uh, that I'm sure that will be discussed over the coming weeks, including, you know, innovations in printing, uh, innovations in, uh, in all types of, uh, of observations of, of other types of natural sciences. And you'll see that my presentation is skewed toward geology, uh, just because that's my background and that's where I've done most of my, my research. Uh, New Harmony is really a remote location, especially in the 19th century. It was on the frontier at the time. And, uh, and I think, you know, one of the questions is why would so many natural scientists and, and, and educators want to move to this frontier community? And I think for the natural scientists and artists, it was an opportunity to discover new things. And as a natural scientist, that's one of the things that's always exciting is the discovery of new knowledge. And so William McClure spent a lot of time in Philadelphia recruiting his colleagues, artists, scientists, and educators to, to move uh, to New Harmony. And so I'm gonna split the presentation into two parts. The first part are kind of this original group of, of natural scientists, artists, and educators that came to New Harmony. I'm gonna highlight some of their expertise as well as their, their abilities. And it's really amazing the types of things that they accomplished. And then the second part of the presentation is I'm going to take a, a deeper dive into Robert Owen's family, in particular, his sons and daughters, and talk about some of their accomplishments and the legacy of New Harmony that continued on uh, through the 19th century. So uh, this is a, a great painting. This is actually from the Working Men's Institute. It was uh, uh, painted for the 100th anniversary of the founding of New Harmony. It was part of the first centennial celebration in New Harmony. And essentially, it, it, it's the deeding of New Harmony to Robert Owen from Father Rapp. And uh, again, although uh, the community only lasted 
about two years, uh, you could see that it, it, it had profound impacts and, and long lasting uh, legacy. Uh, one of the things about the failure here is Owen withdrew completely from the community in 1828. Uh, there were a lot of issues with respect to uh, uh, disagreements about agriculture, labor, uh, religion, uh, as well as a rift between William McClure and Robert Owen. And so Owen completely withdrew in 1828 and he lost about 40,000 uh, pounds, about 80% of his fortune from, from this uh, experiment. So the post-communal period and legacy, so this is from about 1827 to 1835. Uh, this became a very, very dynamic community. Uh, a lot of the scientists, educators, artists, and others decided to remain in New Harmony. Uh, in particular, Charles Alexander Lesser and Thomas Say, who were both naturalists. And, uh, and interestingly enough, uh, a lot of Robert Owen's children, uh, in fact, uh, all of his living children uh, lived and, and worked in New Harmony. So William McClure uh, is considered the father of American geology. He's also the first president of the Philadelphia Academy of Sciences, and he partnered with Robert Owen to experiment with this hands-on educational experience. Uh, he William McClure also founded the Working Men's Institute, which uh, is the oldest in New Harmony. It's the oldest public uh, library that's been continuously operating. Uh, and William McClure invested his money into this Working Men's Institute, which provided a, essentially an educational avenue for the working person. And, uh, and it says it's recording. I don't want to record. And, and so um, Gerard Troost also was recruited by Roy McClure and moved to New Harmony. He lived and worked in New Harmony from 1825 to 1827. And then he became state geologist of Tennessee, which he served from 1831 to 1850. He was the first president of the Philadelphia Academy of Sciences. And he actually developed the method for state geological surveys, and he was the mentor to David Doe Owen. So I'll be talking about David Doe Owen here very shortly. Charles Alexander Lesser was uh, a very great naturalist uh, doing work around the world and lived in New Harmony from 1826 to about 1834 to 1837 uh, and described a lot of fossils. So I put a few uh, fossils that actually uh, were described by Charles Alexander Lesser, one in honor of William McClure, uh, but he also was very well known for his study of ichthyology, which is the study of fish, and his illustrations were very, very, very artistic, so very much an artist in his own right. In addition, um, William McClure uh, recruited uh, Virginia Duplé to teach uh, within the New Harmony schools. And so she was actually a student in McClure's Philadelphia schools uh, under uh, uh, Marie Forgot. Uh, and she was a member of Lasser's party on the Bolo of Knowledge, and she taught sketching and watercolor in the New Harmony schools. And she also prepared uh, illustrations for some of the New Harmony publications. And I was able to track down a few uh, pieces of art that, that were completed by Virginia Duplé. And so on the left is a prickly wild rose that uh, she drew and painted, uh, probably around 1830 in New Harmony. And on the right is a Northern Shrike. Uh, and I, I put some photographs in there to, to show you the accuracy of, of that artistic work uh, that she completed. Thomas Say, another natural scientist focused on the study of conchology and shells, also named a lot of fossils, uh, including in honor of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he was also a member of the Longs Expedition, uh, and he collaborated with Titian Pill, who illustrated a lot of his plates for American entomology, and he lived in New Harmony in 1826 until his death in 1834. And Thomas A. is actually buried on the uh, Rat McClure uh, estate. There's a tomb uh, 
uh, in which Thomas A. is buried. These are just some of the brilliant illustrations that were included in American uh, entomology. On the left is uh, a pipevine swallowtail, really beautiful. That, this was drawn uh, by, um, by Thomas A. And on the right side, uh, again, uh, this one has, was actually drawn by Titian Peel, uh, but it gives you an idea of just the beautiful artwork that was involved in some of this, some of this early scientific work. Uh, probably another very significant figure early on in New Harmony was uh, the uh, wife of Thomas A, Lucy, Lucy Sister Say. Uh, she became a teaching apprentice in the Petzolosian School in, in Philadelphia, operated by Marie Farragut. Uh, she had artistic training from Charles Alexander Lesseur, and she uh, was actually the first woman to be elected the member of the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia in 1841. And, and that honor is really related to her work on uh, American conchology. So it turns out most of the illustrations that are included in Thomas Say's American conchology were, were actually put together and, and, and drawn by Lucy Sister Say. And so these are just a couple of plates from American conchology that really reflect her very sharp artistic abilities in capturing uh, the appearance and, and the morphology of some of these shells. Uh, New Harmony was also visited by uh, several famous artists and natural scientists, uh, especially in this early part of, of New Harmony's history. Uh, one of the more famous explorations was by uh, Prince Maximilian, uh, who brought along Carl Bodner, uh, a really prominent artist of the day, to document his journey up the Mississippi, Missouri River. Uh, and he's well known for his portraits of Native Americans, and, and uh, it's pretty impressive some of the artwork that he was able to accomplish. And, and some of this artwork was of New Harmony. So this is a, a lithograph uh, from Carl Bodner uh, of an of a illustration uh, or watercolor done by Carl Bodner. Uh, and it, it shows the town of New Harmony, which you can see. So mm -hmm. I apologize, folks. It looks like we might be having some technical difficulties. Um, let's give it a second or two. Bill, are you back? Yeah. Can you hear All me right. now? Okay. Yeah, you went out for just a second, but we're good. Okay, great. So uh, this is a, a port portrait that was painted by Carl Bodner of Charles Alexander Lazar. So the history there is really intriguing. And there was a lot accomplished in these early days from about 18... Uh, 26 to 1834 to 37. So now I'm going to shift gears to talk about uh, Owen's family. And so it turns out five of Robert Owen's children uh, lived and worked in New Harmony. Uh, his other two children, so Anne Caroline and Mary both passed away in Scotland uh, along with their mother uh, in 1831, 1832. And right about that time is when Jane Dell Owen uh, moved to the community in New Harmony to live with her other siblings. Uh, the four brothers uh, that lived in New Harmony included Robert Dell, William, uh, Jane Dell, or sorry, David Dell and Richard Dell, and then Jane joined them in 1835. I think that's right. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna briefly touch upon some of the accomplishments of, of uh, the children of Robert Owen, but I'm gonna really focus on David Dell and Richard Dell uh, because uh, that plays into some of the work that I've done on the history of geology and its relationship to New Harmony. So Robert Dell Owen uh, became a politician. 
Uh, he co-edited the New Harmony Gazette with Francis Wright in the 18, 1820s in Indiana, and also worked on the Free Inquirer in the 1830s in New York City. He served in the Indiana House of Representatives from 1835 to 1838, 1851 to 1853, and was a U.S. congressman. In U.S. Congress, he was very, very much involved in getting passage for the, for the development and the origin of the Smithsonian Institution. And so he played a very important vital role in the founding of the Smithsonian Institution in 1846. Uh, and accordingly, he was appointed to the Smithsonian Institution's first Board of Regents and chaired its building committee. And I'm going to circle back to this, but, but this, this family relationship uh, also is connected to the Smithsonian. And so I'll, I'll kind of follow up with that a little bit later on. Jane Dell Owen. So she actually moved to New Harmony in 1833. So I think in the previous slide or two, I said 1835, but 1833, not long after her mother passed away. Uh, she was a very proficient artist and teacher, and she also assisted David Dell Owen in some of the illustrations for his geologic reports. Uh, in the 1840s, she established the Seminary for Young Ladies in New Harmony. And uh, one of the other most significant uh, 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 happenings in New Harmony was her daughter Constance uh, founded the Minerva Society, which was a women's literary club, and it was considered one of the earliest women's clubs in America. So pretty amazing accomplishments. So now shifting gears kind of to the to the geology uh, portion. So I'm going to focus uh, mostly on David Dell Owen and Richard Owen. Uh, David Dillon traveled with his father uh, to the United States in 1827, arriving in New York in 1828. He spent a year learning to draw and paint in New York City with his brother, Robert Dell. And, and I think this really had a profound impact on David Dillon. He, he definitely became a very prominent artist as well as a geologist. Uh, he returned to England and studied at the University of London, and he also earned a medical degree in 1837. Uh, there is, David L. Owen and William McClure only overlapped in New Harmony for a very short period of time. And so it's completely unclear how much influence William McClure had on David L. Owen becoming a geologist, uh, but there definitely was an opportunity for them to interact. Uh, David Dell Owen was mentored by Gerard Troost. So Gerard Troost was one of those first uh, uh, scientists that arrived in New Harmony in 1826. And it was really Troost that provided David Dell Owen with his, his understanding of conducting geological surveys and really, really pursuing his passion for geology. And so after this initial uh, geological survey that was conducted of, of Tennessee by Gerard Troost, uh, David Del Owen was appointed by the governor of Indiana in 1837 uh, to complete a geological reconnaissance of the state of Indiana. And this is a cool map that's actually from that report. And you might say, wow, what are these, what are these lines on this map? What do they indicate? Well, in 1837, those are canals that are joining different cities in Indiana. And so transportation at this time was by either horseback or uh, uh, carriage or uh, by canal systems. And so a lot of the reconnaissance and early geological work was conducted along these canals. Um, and David Dell Owen also kind of took a different approach to the study of geology. Uh, previously, you know, a lot of the early geologists were essentially uh, wealthy to, to start out with. And David Dillon was kind of the first geologist that made his living by doing geology. And, and there's a nice quote from 1838 in his report that says, the science of geology of comparatively modern date is now universally conceded to be one of, not of mere curious inquiry, but of vast practical utility. And that was a completely different way of thinking about the application of geology. Uh, in 1830, uh, 
1979, he was appointed uh, by Congress to conduct a survey of the mineral lands of Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Uh, and there's a, there's a neat story here. So he had to train all of the, the geologists that were gonna do this surveying uh, on this excursion. And he actually did the training on the, the boat on the way to the field area. Uh, and so uh, he trained his team while they were on their way to the field site. He also focused on the economic resources. And, and these are just a few of the illustrations drawn by David Dillon included in his reports. Uh, again, David Dillon was a proficient artist and these are just some of the illustrations that were included with his publications in the 1830s. Uh, and early 1840s. Um, this is just a piece of artwork that was included with David Delwan's geologic report. So very proficient artist. And just for comparison, I put an inset photograph there of approximately the same location in which David Del Owen uh, sketched and included in his report. Um, one of the other things that's really interesting is David Dell Owen uh, made New Harmony his home and uh, he converted several buildings in New Harmony to his geological laboratories. And so the Harmony Shoemaker Shop was the second laboratory that David Dell Owen occupied in New Harmony. And this is really from the period from 1835 to 1843 uh, this is the laboratory he used when he started his work as a geologist, the surveys of Indiana, and then also of the surveys in the upper Midwest. And this is a, 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 a layout that was published by Robert Dell Owen of David Dell Owen's laboratory in New Harmony, which gives you a really good idea of what that setting was like. Uh, this, this area here was the lecture hall that David Dell Owen used. Oops. He also had uh, the use of a chemical lab. He had storage for his samples uh, and, and then also had another very large uh, storeroom as well. Now, what's really cool about this particular site is that in the 1970s, there was a group of archeologists led by John Elliott uh, that conducted an excavation of the Harmon and Shoe Shop from 1975 to 1977. Uh, the excavation recovered 353 geological specimens and the original structure, the original building was, was demolished in about 1850. Uh, and over the past two years, uh, I've had a student that's beginning to look at all of these recovered specimens to see if we could trace them back to David L. Owen and also trace back to his work. And so this is just a, a photograph of some of the excavations that were done in the 1970s. I think that that board sided station wagon there in the back gives you a good glimpse of, of the mid 1970s when this excavation was taking place. And these are some of the samples that were recovered from the basement fill of this excavation. And uh, my student, Carner Rose, and I have been working to identify the provenance of these samples. And most likely these samples were collected by, uh, by David Dell Owen conducting his geological surveys of Indiana and the upper Midwest. Uh, letter A is a piece of, of copper ore that David Dell Owen probably collected uh, from uh, Precambrian rocks of, of Wisconsin. Uh, this one's a banded iron formation, also probably from the upper Midwest. This is actually a, a really cool specimen of an ammonite that was probably collected during his geological reconnaissance of Indiana. Uh, and, and this piece right here is a Halicides uh, fossil. And this one was probably collected from the Silurian of Iowa during his surveys of the upper Middle West. And so these samples, this collection is really, really extraordinary uh, because it does tie kind of the archaeology back to some of the work that David Dillon was doing uh, during his time in, in, in that laboratory. 
Uh, the third geological laboratory David Dillon used was the Harmonist Granary. And so it's referred to as the Rap Owen Granary today. Uh, and he served, this laboratory served him from 1843 to 1860. David Del Owen was asked to do another survey for the US uh, government. And so became another US geologist from 18, uh, 1847 to 1852. And this building served as the headquarters for all federal geological surveys from 1847 to 1856. In 1859, David Dellon started construction on a new laboratory, but he unfortunately he was never never able to use that fourth laboratory in New Harmony. But but the building was completed uh, by the time of his death in 1860. Now circling back to the Smithsonian Institution, so Robert Dellon was really involved in putting together the the building plans and and architecture for the Smithsonian, and he wrote a letter to David Dellon asking for recommendations on building materials. And David Dellon was able to recommend the Seneca sandstone, which is the sandstone that occurs along the Potomac River. And that was the stone that was selected for the Smithsonian Institution. So David Dellon played a role in selecting the building material for what is known as the Smithsonian Castle in Washington, DC. Uh, the building was designed by James Renwick Jr., a uh, New York architect. And that has some importance, and I'll circle back to that in just a moment as well. But he designed the Smithsonian uh, castles, as referred to. And the lower image on this slide is of the uh, sandstone quarry from which the stone was, was recovered. And so uh, I've had the privilege of visiting that quarry and being able to see uh, some of the geology in relation to the building stone that was used for the Smithsonian. So Owen's 1847 to 1850 federal survey was uh, a feat of, of incredible amount of geological work and understanding. Uh, he published a, a volume uh, that essentially uh, provided the formatting for following geologic reports. Uh, and, and this work resulted in numerous plates of really detailed illustrations of fossils. Uh, these are just two examples from his geological report. Pretty amazing uh, illustrations that he, he was able to put together on his own. And I do want to point out that, that you know, following Owen's federal surveys, uh, he, he really was on the leading edge of coming up with new illustrative methods, reproduction techniques. He used daguerreotypes uh, for some of his illustrations in this particular volume. Uh, he standardized the method of geological surveys. And essentially, he kind of uh, uh, laid the foundation for the geological railroad surveys in the 1860s and 70s. Um, by the way, when the Smithsonian Institution was completed, the headquarters of these geological surveys were, were moved from New Harmony in 1856 to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. And then following the geological railroad surveys, the 1860s, 1870s, uh, this led to the development of the US Geological Survey in 1879. Uh, David Dolan also did a lot of surveys for other states. So this is just another uh, illustration that's pretty extraordinary, showing his artistic uh, abilities. And this is uh, another really cool building in New Harmony. This is David Dolan's fourth laboratory. It's owned uh, privately. Um, but uh, these are just a few of the geological features that are tied in with the building. So a weather vane that includes some very interesting fossils. Uh, over one of the doorways is a trilobite fossil in iron. It's really cool. And the building itself is just really extraordinary. Um, and, and there's some, I, I you know, I, I need to do a little bit more work here, but uh, this laboratory may have been designed by James Renwick Jr., the same architect that, that uh, constructed the Smithsonian Institution. So. 
Um, Richard Owen uh, had a very similar education to uh, David L. Owen. And David, uh, and, and actually worked with David Owen. He, he actually went on the geological excursions and, and conducted geological surveying with David Dell Owen. So he learned essentially by, by uh, hands-on experiences in the field. Uh, and, and he also was a very prominent artist as well. So this is a, a sketch attributed to Richard Owen that appeared in the geological report published by David Dell Owen. Richard Owen, um, so David Dell Owen passed away in 1860. And then uh, the Civil War uh, kind of derailed things, at least for geological surveys and scientific. And so Richard Owen actually became a colonel in the Civil War. He also became the commandant of Camp Morton in Indianapolis from 1862 to 1863. Um, and, and this print down below is this, this Camp Morton. Uh, this was a woodcut illustration of Harper's Weekly of, of essentially this prisoner camp, Confederate prisoner camp that was operated near Indianapolis. Uh, he also was a professor in natural sciences at any university and the first president of Purdue University. So, uh, you know, the Owens were both a Purdue and Indiana family. So they had connections to both of those institutions. Uh, on the left side is uh, the bust of Colonel Owen that was uh, tri a tribute uh, by former Confederate prisoners of war at Camp Morton of Richard Owen. And so you've got an Indiana State House, you can see this bust of, of Richard Owen. And on the right is actually Owen Hall on the campus of uh, Indiana University. I, I think the bust of Richard Owen there is pretty amazing. I, I would not be opposed to having a bust like that of me someday. I kind of look like a superhero there. I mean, he has a cape and everything. It's pretty, pretty extraordinary. Um, so in continuing kind of this geological progression, it turns out that the, the children that moved to New Harmony during the own experiment that went to the New Harmony schools also played a very important role in the next generation of scientists that pursued different studies. And in particular, Edward Travers Cox is a good example of this continuation. So he moved with his family uh, when he was only uh, five years old to New Harmony. He attended the New Harmony schools. He then assisted David Delon with uh, geological surveys of Arkansas, Indiana, Kentucky, and he actually became the first official state geologist of Indiana. Uh, and also part of his original mineral collection is housed at the Working Men's Institute in New Harmony as well. Uh, he was also a prominent artist. So you can see this theme of this importance of science and art uh, throughout uh, the work of these natural scientists connected to New Harmony. So these are just some examples of, of illustrations that, that were um, drawn by, by Cox. And then uh, there's the continued legacy of New Harmony. So I compiled this table just to show uh, the overlap of a lot of prominent geologists that lived and worked in New Harmony in this period from about 18, uh, 26 all the way to 1860 and beyond. And uh, New Harmony also attracted some of the other famous geologists of the time. So James Hall visited New Harmony in 1841. James Hall is a very famous New York paleontologist that did a lot of work across the United States. And then Sir Charles Lyell in 1846 visited New Harmony uh, as well uh, and, and uh, really uh, spent a lot of time with David Dell Owen exploring his laboratory in New Harmony. And then this is just the kind of showing the legacy and the reach of the work that was done in New Harmony. So these are all geologists that worked with Richard Owen and David Dell Owen. And it includes people like John Evans, who essentially was the geologist for the Oregon and Washington territories, Benjamin Schumard, who was this Texas State geologist, 
uh, Joseph Norwood and Pratton, who worked in Illinois, Fielding B. Meek, who was assistant to James Hall and then uh, was a scientist at the Smithsonian Institution. And, and these are just, <laughs> just a small sampling of the connections that were made by uh, Richard Owen and David Dell Owen uh, with respect to geology in North America. And then we could do the same for some of the other uh, natural scientists from New Harmony, looking at fish, looking at uh, uh, bivalves and, 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 uh, and other uh, shells. It's pretty extraordinary, the scientific work that was done in New Harmony. This is another legacy. These are all fossils named in honor of David Dell Owen. So just to give you an idea of, of how that legacy continued and the recognition that David Dillon received for, for his work. So just to kind of sum up uh, uh, the, the main points of, of this presentation, uh, you know, New Harmony was home to many noteworthy natural scientists. And in particular, Juan McLaren and David Dillon made fundamental contributions to American geology. <laughs> And then I would say, although Robert Owen's social experiment in New Harmony dissolved by 1838, the, continue, the community continued to innovate. Art, education, music, printing, scientific investigation, social justice, theater. Uh, it's quite extraordinary uh, the, the types of, of accomplishments that were made by the residents of New Harmony. And then specifically, the children of Robert Owen found success in a diversity of endeavors, including art, education, geology, and politics. Uh, and they attracted many well-known artistic, political, and scientific influences of the day. Quite an extraordinary feat. And so those are really the fruits of failure with respect to the social experiment is this, this community of, of scientists and artists, educators uh, that really uh, continued this, this legacy through different, different pathways. So with that, I'm going to acknowledge a, a lot of people that assisted me. I had a lot of li librarian and archive specialists help me pull different images and photographs and, and publications. Uh, and, and a slew of people that I've worked with and talked with New Harmony about, Ryan Rokiki, uh, uh, director uh, of the Working Men's Institute, uh, as well as Todd Thompson at the Geological and Water Survey. So with that, I'm happy to entertain questions that you might have, and I hope you enjoyed this, this path uh, through kind of this legacy of New Harmony. All right, thank you so much, Bill. That was a fantastic pres er, uh, presentation. Um, and we definitely appreciate you being here today. We do have a few questions. And of course, everyone, if you have more, please get them, get them in. Um, the first one was about Titian Peel. Um, was he in New Harmony at some point? No. So uh, I'm just gonna flip back through slides yes. here. So Tishy and Pill was in Philadelphia. And so some of the work that was done on entomology was done actually in Philadelphia before Thomas A. moved to New Harmony. Uh, Tishy and Pill is, is important because he is the son of uh, Charles Wilson Pill, who was a very famous portrait artist early on. And if you look at the portrait here of Thomas A., it was painted by Charles Wilson Pill. Same thing for the portrait of Charles Alexander Lasseur, as well as Gerard Troost, as well as William McClure. And so uh, very, very much important uh, artistic family in Philadelphia. And so Tishy and Pill uh, worked on American entomology when Thomas A. lived in Philadelphia before moving to New Harmony. All right. Um, are the geological specimens uh, that you recovered from the shoe factory site archived at USI and are they available uh, for the public to look at? Well, these samples until two years ago were in storage and, and no one really took a look 
at the samples or to do a very detailed look at and describing uh, the samples. So right now they're currently at uh, University of Southern Indiana in a secure lab. Uh, and we have all those samples laid out and, and my under, undergraduate student is working through identifying those samples. And so the first thing is we need to archive and record everything that we have. And then, you know, the next step really comes down to is I think, you know, selecting some of the, the key specimens maybe for a temporary display uh, would be really cool. And so, so I think that's something we can maybe do in the future. But at this point, we're trying to get a handle on what's there and what connections we can make. And so it's been a really exciting uh, 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 project. And like I said, you know, uh, th those samples were, were not looked at for about 40 some years. And so we're very happy to be going through and, and looking at this material and, and, and learning something from it. Um, I did want to, I think that might be the end of our questions, but I did want to point out one thing when you're talking about Thomas Say, um, that he, and I mentioned this in the chat, but he also discovered Say's Firefly, which is the state insect of Indiana, for those of you that don't know that. And that's a really cool backstory. If you're interested in that, you should definitely look that up. Yes, absolutely. There's just so many um, interconnections. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. All right, well, I think that might be the end of our questions. And um, I just have a quick kind of um, wrap up here. Claire, this is Don Pitzer. Could I say something, please? Of course, of course. <clears throat> um, I just want to congratulate uh, Bill Elliott. Uh, this is the best and most complete scientific evidence uh, ever gathered together that shows how successful the Owen McClure uh, community was. If they had not established that community, which absolutely uh, did not succeed as far as a communal group and is often called a failure, but you have to go beyond that and you see how this developed into attracting all of these scholars, all of this scientific development, um, probably the discoveries that made for the industrialization of the Midwest. And uh, so I congratulate you uh, Dr. Elliott, and <clears throat> I'm so glad that John Elliott's collection is there secure in your department. Thank you. Well, uh, let's just uh, wrap this up. Uh, once again, we really uh, thank everyone. Ooh going too far there. Thank everyone for joining us today. As I mentioned uh, earlier, this is the first uh, virtual conversation of the year and the first one um, with the Robert Owen 250th celebration. Uh, we have a ton of upcoming events and I just wanted to point out two. Um, on May 15th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Owen Square in New Harmony, which is across the street from Thrall's Opera House, we are going to be celebrating Robert Owen's birthday with a grand birthday party. Um, and we might even have Robert Owen as a guest himself. Uh, we invite you to come join us. It'll be fun. We'll have cookies. We'll have music. Um, and of course, we will be following COVID-19 protocols, so we will be safe as well. Uh, additionally, we have our next virtual conversation on Thursday, May 20th at 1 p.m. And that's Painting the Great Window with Matthew J. Mosca. Um, Matthew Mosca is a paint, a historical paint analyst um, who will uh, be telling us about the work that went into restoring the Harmonist fan window uh, that was, was uh, completed in the last year or so. I um, mean, he'll also be talking about some of the other work he's done throughout New Harmony uh, with both historic New Harmony owned buildings, as well as Indiana State Museum owned buildings um, and other privately owned uh, buildings in town. Uh, please stay connected with us. Uh, we do uh, encourage you to visit our website, usi.edu forward slash historic new harmony uh, for any questions or to see any of our upcoming programs. Um, we're also very active on social media, Facebook, and Instagram, so definitely follow us there. And then finally, uh, we do have an e-newsletter um, that comes out monthly, which you can find online at usi.edu forward slash in harmony. Uh, once again, thank you. 
Uh, thank you to Indiana Humanities uh, for their generous support in this programming, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great day, everyone.